So what looks like a very innocent thing of putting it in one loop or not putting it in one loop, for example, had I, okay, mistake on my part that I was trying to put it into the V's, suppose I did not put it into the V's and just talked about putting the normalized things into the Q's, then the natural algorithm one would have written is this one. Right? This is the natural algorithm one would write. If the V's had to be orthonormalized and put into Q's, this is the natural one that one would write. And if you wrote this, then the three vectors that you got were nowhere close to being orthogonal. Yeah? But because I was trying to put them into the V's, then it looked very clumsy that I had two loops. Yeah, the reason why I was going to put the two loops is because I wanted to bring out this difference. Yeah? So a simple thing like putting that loop into this, you see when you are updating this VK, each time you calculate RIK and you update this VK, you are now taking the next time round, when you take this inner product, you are not taking this inner product with the original V, you are taking it with the modified V and that makes a difference. Is that okay? That makes a difference. It looks like a very small thing, but it makes all the difference, as you can see from this very simple example. Okay? Is that fine? So, the first, this one would be the standard Gram Schmidt, and once you put it into the loop, which is what is being written here, then what you have is the modified Gram-Schmidt, which is of course much more stable than the original Gram-Schmidt. The original Gram-Schmidt is, is quite an unstable algorithm. You have just seen it. What makes it stable? Okay. See, what, what is happening is exactly what, I do not remember which one somebody pointed out earlier. You see, what you are doing is you are taking this VK and finding the component of VK along some QI that you have already determined. Okay? And then you are subtracting that amount. Yeah? Now, in when do the errors occur the most? When you do additions or subtractions, provided the numbers are nearby and things like that. So, when you make this subtraction, you see, each time you are subtracting, taking the inner product of VK with the QIs that you have calculated. So, when you subtract out, there are still some components which are the error and they remain. Yeah, they get carried. On the other hand, if you are each time using the updated VK, it is the updated VK's component along the other direction that you are now subtracting. Yeah, what I am trying to say is, when you subtract R i k q i, what gets subtracted may not be only things in the q i direction, but also maybe some things in the other directions are getting subtracted. Yeah? But when you go back and calculate the next R i k using the old v i, then these other components are still there in the old V i. Yeah? So, it is again getting subtracted. So, it is getting over subtracted. On the other hand, if you use the modified V k, it is only the modified V k's component along the new Q i that you are subtracting. Yeah? And that is what is making the difference. It seems like a very small thing, but it makes a huge difference as you see. Okay. Yeah. And of course, the set of VIs that I started this off with, this is a bad set. Why do you think this is a bad set? I am saying that this set of vectors is a bad set. Yeah, they are 
almost linearly dependent. Yeah, and we have already said that for a square matrix, the condition number is high if the components give you, I mean, if the rows or the columns are almost linearly dependent. Of course, here you do not get a square matrix. You get a 4 cross 3 matrix if you put these 3, if you put these 3 columns together. Yeah? But they are almost linearly independent. So, I could say that the condition number of this matrix that you get A by putting this V1, V2, V3 together, the condition number is bad or large. Yeah? Of course, that brings us to the question of how do you define condition number for matrices which are not square. So far, we have only defined condition numbers for matrices which are square. Yeah. So, how would one do it? So, let us define condition number for matrices which are tall. How would we do this? Huh? No, we will not use a sub matrix. We will use something that comes from the original. So, what we did we define condition number as? So, for a, a which was square, what was the condition number? How did we define this? We took the norm of A and multiplied to the norm of A inverse. Right? But somewhere along the way, we also said this is the same as maximum magnification due to A divided by minimum magnification due to A. So, we will use this to define condition number for a tall matrix. Okay? So, you can talk about the maximum magnification of A. A tall matrix A, what would be the maximum magnification? Maximum magnification of A would be max norm of x equal to 1. You post multiply with some vector x, norm of x equal to 1 A x. Yeah, of course, norm of x equal to 1, so good enough. And minimum magnification? min norm of x equal to 1. We will continue to use norm of x equal to 1 because that would give you the unit sphere. Yeah, because going anywhere because of linearity. So, because of this we do not have to talk about the condition when x is 0. That is also ruled out. A of x. You take the ratio between these two. Yeah, and that gives you the condition number of a. So, we will use this definition to talk about condition number of a tall matrix. Is that okay? Yeah. And uh, for example, earlier we had talked about this A being written as Q1 R1. So, this Q1 is also a tall matrix and what is the condition number of that? It will be 1. Yeah, it will be 1. K of this Q 1 will be 1. Yeah, so these things are called isometry. You know, Q's which are a part of an orthogonal matrix which you take and form a tall matrix, you call it an isometry because essentially the condition number is 1 and you have this property Q1 transpose Q1 is identity. Because of that, you call this an isometry. Yeah. It is like embedding a smaller dimensional subspace into a larger dimensional subspace. You have exact image or replica of the smaller subspace in this larger subspace. Yeah, which is why the 
term isometry yeah, because you do not change anything else. Is that okay? Yeah, like because if you have a basis for a space R n and you multiply it with an orthogonal matrix, then you obtain new basis, but you have changed nothing. You have as we have already discussed, you have preserved the angles between vectors, you have preserved the sizes of the vectors and so on. Yeah. Now, if you use this tall matrix, which is of this form, Q1 transpose Q1 is identity and essentially this KQ1 is 1, then what you are doing is uh, vectors of smaller dimensions, you are jacking it up into a larger dimensional space. So, in the larger dimensional space, for every vector in the smaller dimensional space, you have a corresponding vector in the larger dimensional space. Yeah? And now, if two vectors, if a vector had a certain length, then its image would have what length in the larger dimensional space? What do you think would be the length image? What, would, what do you think would be the length of the image? Hmm? Can you show it? that it will be the same. Just two things you have to say and then it will be accepted it is the same. Just two things. Actually one thing. So, maximum Sorry? No, no, no. It is nothing to do with maximum minimum magnification. Yes. Q1, Q1 transpose Q1 is 1. Qi transpose Qi is 1. Q i transpose Q j is 0. Yeah, you get what I am saying? So, you have this matrix Q 1 up to Q m and you are multiplying it with alpha 1 up to alpha m. Then what is the image? The image is a vector which is alpha i Q i summation i going from 1 to m. This is the image. Right? Okay. So, how do you find the length of this? Take the inner product. Yeah? And now what will happen here? Well, you can pull out the alpha i's from both these things and you will be left with just checking out inner products of QIs with QJs. Yeah? QI inner product QJ is 0 unless I is equal to J. So, the only time you will get non-zero elements is when, so what this will turn out to be would be summation from I from 1 to M alpha I squared, which is exactly the same as what would be the length squared of this vector alpha 1 up to alpha m. Is that okay? So, the image of this will have a length which is exactly the same. Of course, it is a new metric yeah, because it is a metric, it is the, it is a metric in R n as opposed to R m. Okay? It is a norm in R n as opposed to R m, but the norm in that new norm, this image will have the same numerical value as what was the norm of the original vector in R m. Okay? What about angles? So, the angles will also be preserved. Okay? So, if you take a piece of the orthogonal matrix, it also does the same job as the orthogonal matrix. The orthogonal matrix preserves angles and, and uh, lengths. Here you are jacking it up into some larger dimension where again the lengths and the angles are preserved. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. Now uh, we've talked about the Gram Schmidt. Uh, one can talk about how good is the set of vectors Q1. Okay, you do the Gram Schmidt, the modified Gram Schmidt. Huh? The modified, which is the one which will, the one which will, you know, find the. Yeah. holds. But, uh, okay, that largest eigenvalue interpretation is to do with the two norm, condition number with respect to a two norm. So, here also it will hold. We will come to that. Yeah, the two norm is special in some way. Yeah, and when I say this isometries are preserving length and so on, I am talking about the two norm. Yeah, just now I was talking about the two norm in RM going to the two norm in R n. I am not talking about any old norm. It is not, re uh, when we are talking about this inner product in this way, we are really talking about the two norm. Yeah, we have left behind the discussion of general norms and we are sticking to two norm now, ever since we started talking about orthogonal matrices. Okay. All right. So, you use the Gram-Schmidt modified. One would like to know how good is your result. Yeah, that means, one would like to talk about the backward stability of this thing. All right. So, it turns out, if you, if you have a set of vectors, if you are given a set of vectors V1 up to Vm and you use the modified method Gram Schmidt method to find Q1 up to Qm. Okay. How would we check whether this Q1 up to Qm actually spans the space V1 up to Vm and is really an orthogonal set? What's the best way to check that? Well, we can assume that Q1 up to Qm, since you are obtaining Q1 up to Qm from V1 up to Vm, you can assume they will span roughly the same spaces. Yeah, I mean, at most small error. But the problem really seems to be whether Q1 up to Qm is an ortho, orthogonal set. Yeah, like what we saw earlier. Yeah, that Q2 inner product with Q3 turned out to be half rather than anything close to zero. So, we have a way of implementing orthogonalization. We are given V1 up to Vm, we have found Q1 up to Qm. How will we check whether this is a good enough orthogonal set of vectors? Can you suggest some way? Take inner products between all of them and then? Yeah, I take inner products between all of them and we want all the norms of these guys to be 1 and inner product between Qi and Qj to be 0. But how are we going to quantify whether one set of Q1 up to Qm that you obtain by some algorithm and another set of Q1 up to Qm? By some other algorithm, one is better than the other. What do you think? Q into Q transpose. Huh? Q into Q transpose. Yeah. Should be close to identity. Oh, very good. So you just list this Q1 up to Qm as Q, and then Q transpose Q. This should be as close to identity as possible. Right? It should be exactly identity. Okay. So, we look at identity minus Q transpose Q and we will find the norm of this matrix. Okay. If the norm of this matrix is 0, then we know we have exactly got an orthonormal set. 
Yeah, so the smaller the norm, the better of this matrix I minus Q transpose Q. It will tell you how close you have got this Q1 up to Qm that you have got, how close it is to being an orthonormal set. Is, is the argument fine? Yeah. So, for Gram Schmidt modified, if you try to find out how close this is, it turns out that this norm, the two norm of identity minus Q transpose Q, it can be shown as less than some some modest multiple of the unit round of times the condition number of a yeah and what is this a a is really v1 up to vm the original set of vectors. So, we have just defined what we mean by a condition number of A. Okay. Is it fine? So, how good your result is will depend upon the condition number of the original set of vectors given to you. Okay. If the original set of vectors that is given to you is badly conditioned, then the set of vectors that you will get, you cannot expect it to be, per, I mean by the process you cannot expect to get a set Q1 up to Qm, which is perfectly orthogonal. Is that fine? Yeah, so that is what I was talking about. If if Q1, okay, the way we are getting Q1, Q2, and so on is Q1 is exactly the same as V1. Yeah, Q2 we are you know throwing, we are using V2, and we are throwing out a part of Q, uh, a component in the direction of Q1. Okay, it is possible that during the subtraction, the vector q2 that you get that is span of q1 and q2 is not really the span of v1 and v2 it is possible yeah but if that does happen what one would expect is this is a two dimensional plane span by v1 and v2 and the two dimensional space span by q1 and q2 will be a slight deviation of this yeah we don't expect it to be swinging around is that okay? So, we would assume that the errors that would come from the span is small enough. Yeah, that assumption we are making, which, which is what I said some time back. So, we will make the assumption that Q1 up to Qm is spanning roughly the same space as V1 up to Vm. Yeah. Of course, you could change the order of V1 up to Vm and find another set Q1 up to Qm. Yeah, I am given V1 up to Vm, right? I permute the order. All right? I can permute the order and then run the same Gram-Schmidt algorithm. I will get a new Q1 up to Qm. Yeah, how different is that from this one? In the sense, does it span a completely different space than the original one. Now, if you do runs of this, you would find that whatever you do, if you permute and you calculate new set of orthogonal vectors, they roughly span the same space. Okay? That is essentially because for each subsequent calculation for qi, you are using the vi's. So, that is why this, this happens, that the, the space span by the Qi's is roughly the same as the space span by the Vi's, roughly. Okay, there isn't much deviation there, but the huge deviations seem to appear with the inner products between the Qi's. Yeah, that means you do this Gram-Schmidt, you don't seem to get ortho 
orthogonal q1 up to qm. Okay? So, that is what we are checking here and it turns out this is dependent on the condition number of A. Yeah? Okay? Now, if it is dependent on the condition number of A, there is a reasonably easy way to get rid of it. What would that be? get rid of, I mean, you know, you are given V1 up to Vm and let us say the condition number of this matrix A is bad. You run it through this algorithm, you get Q1 up to Qm, but this Q1 up to Qm may not be a real ortho normal set. Okay? But we want to get a very good ortho normal set. What should one do? Exactly. Run it once more. This time you run it on the Q1 up to Qm. Now, what do you think? Q1 up to Qm, what do you think about the condition number of this? Certainly going to be better than the initial one. Yeah? This process of running Gram Schmidt twice is called reorthogonalization. So, you run it once, you might get a q1 up to qm, which is not orthogonal enough, but certainly the condition number has to improve. So, you run it the second time and you do not need to run it more than twice, yeah, because the first time round, this limit tells you that the amount of error is limited by the condition number times some modest multiple of the machine error. Is that okay? So, the first time round this error is upper bounded by this. So, that actually gives you that the condition number should become much better now. So, second time round it will be k of q here. Okay? And then you should get a proper orthonormal set. Yeah? Now, if you want to incorporate reorthogonalization you run Gram Schmidt, you run it a second time. But you know you do not even need to do that. What you could do is you do these calculations and do it a second time in the same run. Yeah. That means you subtract V k q i, you subtract it. So finally you get a V k. Now, rather than taking that V k and you know normalizing it, you run through the same cycle one more time. Why wait until everything is over? You just run through it once more. Yeah, so, you can incorporate it at this stage itself and you get the, re -or uh, the re orthogonalization, and then you should get a much better result as far as the Gram Schmidt is concerned. Yeah. What about the complexity of this thing? What is the order? by now you know how to calculate the order. Yeah? Do I have more time? It is over. Okay, so, you do it at home. Calculate what this is. It will turn out to be m squared n minus something I guess. No? Just m squared n. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is roughly m squared n minus something. 
maybe some coefficient for the n, n square, nm squared, some coefficient also. Okay, but you can work that out. All right. Okay.